Well, it's better than what I had in my head previously, which was randomly the theme tune to Dixon of Dark Green. Very okay. nice. Oh, no, it's not. It's just one the way. Uh, at least it was <laughs> where I picked it up from. At least it wasn't the theme tune to Heartbeat. Ah, don't do that! <laughs> I suppose it is Sunday night. If you're going to have a theme tune to Heartbeat <laughs> stuck in your head any time, it might as well be now. <laughs> it's Sunday night. Prepare for mild peril in a comedic fashion at a fate. Yep. Not to be confused with Mild Beryl, the sequel to Last of the Summer Wine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's literally loitering time, folks. We are the Geek Show's dedicated arts, books and culture podcast, although you wouldn't know it. Uh, <laughs> I am Graham, and this week I've been joined by Sarah. Hello. Rob. Whatever. And Andrew. <laughs> I um, I forgot to press record until about halfway through this introduction. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I, I took a risk sort of blending it with the pre-show nonsense, but uh, we're all up and running now, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I guess I've been recording all the words coming out my mouth. <laughs> Technically, I'm sitting down. Nah. <laughs> I'll sort it out. It, it's fine. We'll fix it in post. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Classic words. As I say, uh, this is Literary Loitering, and every week we like to start off uh, by asking what we've all been reading. I've been reading a, a set of two novels by M. John Harrison, Signs of Life and The Course of the Heart. Uh, Signs of Life is good. I'm just finishing that off now, but The Course of the Heart is excellent. And mm. it is one of those books that has ideas and opinions and feelings in it that you feel like you yourself have had but you've never known how to express them that well it's just absolutely wonderful and it features repeated visions of a strange ghostly couple having sex upside down while hovering so what the hell more do you want oh wow (laughs) well it's something to do on a sunday after midsummer murders (laughs) (laughs) I don't really think I can top that, really. <laughs> oh, you'd bottom it. Oh, yes. <laughs> if anything, it's too late now because we've already had upside down sex ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> We're still getting through Ali Smith's Winter, which is really good, but um, we've not picked it up for a while <laughs> um, because we forgot. <laughs> right, fair enough. <laughs> But we've given up on Stephen Benatar's See Her Safe at Home on the grounds that we're not sure what's happening. Yeah, well, that's a good reason to stop reading something, I guess. <laughs> you know, QI is like this big thing, yeah? Yeah. Massive, massive franchise on the BBC. Uh, and Sandy Toxway hosts it now. I thought, okay, quite interesting. It's qu- It's a great show. But how can I make myself more interesting? How can I have some of that knowledge kind of absorbed into myself. So maybe if I ever get invited to a party someday, then maybe I could be that interesting person in the corner who knows all these random bits of knowledge. Yeah. And so I've been reading Shot's original miscellany from 2002. (laughs) Ah, wow. That's a blast from the past. I that was an absolute sensation when it was published. Yeah, um, I, I totally forgot Shots Miscellany was a thing. I kind of got to Shots Miscellany uh, when I ordered a book from Amazon called Fox Tossing, Octopus Wrestling, and Other Forgotten Spots. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, I, was, uh, I, I thought I'll go with uh, Shots Miscellany first and then... The fox tossing and octopus wrestling, that can come after. That's the dessert. That, yeah, th- there's definitely a quiz in that, right? <laughs> oh, God, yes. <laughs> but Shots Miscellany is just like, it's wonderful just how random it is. Well, I suppose that, that goes with the title. Yes. yes. Yeah. I, too, feel so... I, could be, I could be on QI. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about the contents. Where do I start? <laughs> 
I don't know. That's why that's we the, said it randomly because we didn't have any that's suggestions. The, that's, the, that's the problem. Where do you start with something like this? I'll just pick a page. Uh, page 71. What's on that page? Oh, uh, now you're asking. I have to go get the book. Your quest to be the interesting person at the party has not got off to a fly. <laughs> no, it start. hasn't because the book's in the other room. Oh. <laughs> uh, I don't know if anyone else here watches the what we do in the Shadows TV show. Yes, it's Ace. It is. But I, I, I believe Rob is maybe just some kind of Colin Robinson-esque energy vampire. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me move. Don't make me move. It's comfortable. Uh, I don't think Colin Robinson was ever this pitiable. <laughs> <laughs> he may be. You never know. Could be, yeah. So I take it Shots Miscellany is just a book of random facts. Yes, basically. Okay. And little tidbits of knowledge. Um, yeah, like, you know, how do you murder someone? What was uh, what was on. so's car? What? That, I don't remember that being <laughs> part of it. press uh, campaign. Back yeah. it up a bit. <laughs> like I said, uh, I mean, uh, when I read the thing on uh, Amazon, it had like a bunch of stuff. I thought, ooh, that yeah. looks interesting. And so I ordered it because um, it was saying, oh, do you want to know what John Lennon's cat was called and stuff like that? I mm. thought, ooh, that looks interesting because <laughs> I don't know what John really? Lennon's cat was called. Really I don't know. Whiskey vibe to some of this, isn't there? But... <laughs> so... uh, yes. So, Andrew, what have you been reading? Yeah, I have been reading uh, Ronan Coughlin's The Illustrated Encyclopedia of Arthurian Legends. Wowzers! Yeah. It's cool. an encyclopedia about Arthurian legends, and it's <laughs> illustrated. <laughs> I'm very sorry, Rob, but I think your place as the interesting guy at the party has just been filled. Yes. <laughs> it's difficult to be Arthur. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting experience, kind of. Sort of like with the Egyptology book I was reading, of just taking this mm. much wider, overarching view of things. Mm. Yeah, because um, I, I think it's maybe something if you're not that familiar with Arthurian law, you kind of can get it into your head that there's like a definitive King Arthur timeline. Mm. And there's uh. not, there's like bloody hundreds of different contradictory stories <laughs> of what went on during Arthur times. Oh, wow. Has it filled the space that would otherwise have been filled by that awesome looking Dev Patel starring Sir Gawain in the Green Knight film that hasn't been released because of the COVID. I mean, you've you've literally hit upon like what got me to start reading it was just going, to, yeah. oh yeah, Green Knight was supposed to be out. <laughs> wow. Um, yes, it is because it's kind of brought to my attention the even better than the Green Knight Arthurian semi joke story. Oh. Where King Arthur is killed by a big cat called the Cath Palag, and then that cat becomes King of England. <laughs> <laughs> and she still is today. <laughs> oh, wow. It's such a shame that Agnes Varda never got to make that movie. <laughs> That's a joke about Agnes Varda liking cats, listeners. If you want more of those, our sister podcast, Cinema Eclectic Airs, <laughs> new episodes every Wednesday most of which will have that exact reference. That sounds fantastic. If I wanted to support that financially, how might I go about it? <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it when you do your infomercial <laughs> voice. <laughs> that sounds like fantastic. How do you want my money? <laughs> <laughs> how might I get my money to you? www.patreon.com forward slash the geek show and that goes for all of our podcasts too <laughs> yes that now we've done that shamelessness uh, <laughs> spontaneous shamelessness sh spontaneous sh spawn shamelessness <laughs> shall we go on to the news no because yeah. if you're allowed to do that i'm allowed to do my thing oh which <gasps> is to say you know one time i asked king arthur if i could be one of his knights if, if, you know, I could replace one of the existing ones. Oh. But, you know, he, he seemed quite apathetic about the whole idea. Because mm. when I asked him 
which of you knights can I replace? He just said, K. That's a nice Because one of the knights is called K. I figured listen, that was the answer, listen. but I can still hear the north wind and a distant bell tolling. <laughs> listen, so three out of the five people who listen to this podcast found that hilarious. <laughs> News time. <laughs> <laughs> and are you going to yes. sound the horn off like Ron Burgundy? <laughs> oh God! Why haven't we got a sound effects desk for this podcast? And then find out we're all just over in the corner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, we had a bit of a debate on the last show about what book shopping will be like when we all come back from the pandemic and with the economy beginning to open up again, as we record this, we are starting to see some answers. In the case of Waterstones, what it's going to look like is the reverse. Hmm. Specifically, the back cover of a book, which will now be put on display in Waterstones so that people can read it without having to handle the book itself. And it's caused outrage, by which I mean mild consternation, uh, among people who design book covers. Um, I mean, why? Because it's their job and their responsibility, and um, surely they've done some work they're incredibly proud of. I just don't understand. Essentially, yes. It's like they haven't heard that famous saying about judging books by their covers, which I think <laughs> comes out on the anti side. <laughs> Uh, oh, so I still remember that quiz we did last time. Yes. And uh, maybe you don't deserve to have a job designing book covers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If we're allowed a James Bond book cover that's just a nose and a pair of jubblies, <laughs> then what's even the point? <laughs> <laughs> if we're allowed a Brothers Karamazov book yes. cover that's basically a couple of underwear models, as I remember, <laughs> yes. um, then, uh, yeah, yeah, look to your book designing prowess, book designers. Uh, if you haven't heard the last show, listeners, it is still available. Andrew is referring to the Octo Pussy sequel, Tit Nostril. <laughs> See, the problem is that does work to the tune of Goldfinger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, Shelley Bassey could do wonders with that. Dear <laughs> Nestrin! Fantastic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> So as ever, my favourite thing about these stories, about people being very angry about something or other, is getting down to the bottom of the page and finding the one guy who's just like, uh, can't be asked. <laughs> um, <laughs> after a lot of people suggesting potential problems, like maybe showing the front cover of the book alongside the back cover, uh, <laughs> Then the book cover designer, David Pearson, says it actually makes our credits more visible. And since we designed the back cover as well, it's a win-win. <sighs> fair enough. I mean, yeah, fair, fair enough. enough. Yes. <laughs> when bookstores reopen, there will obviously be some safety measures put in place and... You know, some some things people just have to take into their own hands. So I'd like to say this for our listeners as a public service announcement from Literary Loitering. Do not, I repeat, do not microwave your books. Oh, thank God you said that because I've got a stack of books here and, uh, and a handy microwave. <laughs> so, so what, are you saying I should just eat them cold? <laughs> I'm, is, it, is, is it okay to microwave them if they don't have that weird plastic cover on the paperbacks that the libraries used to put on them? Well, I mean, that's one danger, but uh, the Kent District Library in Grand Rapid, Mitch. Gra in Grand, Grand, Ra Grand Rapid? In Grand Rapid, Michigan. <laughs> Grand Rapid, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Grand Rabbit, yes. Quite a lot of America seems to be Grand Rabbit at the moment. Um, 
Also, Sarah, page 71 has famous cats and dog owners and pie. Finally. <laughs> Bloody hell, man. <laughs> Thank God Rob isn't employed at a library. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be a librarian, I love you, know. <laughs> Did you? In another life, Not yet. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> Yes, uh, the Kent District Library in Grand Rapids, Michigan, has said that some people seem to have fallen for a piece of misinformation that microwaving a library book will destroy any COVID-19 bacteria, but one, it doesn't, and two, the tags in the book used to scan them in and out contain metal, which, I mean, your book definitely will not have COVID-19 on it after it catches fire. <laughs> I just want to be on the a fly on the wall for just whoever it is decided. I'm going to tell people they should microwave their books. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I get the feeling that about 90% of the last decade's history can boil down to one guy thinking, maybe I should post that, see how it turns out. Other librarians in America have been coming up with some some better uses of technology for the library trade, including Kelly Pasek, a school librarian in Virginia, who has ensured that kids in her community still have books during lockdown by delivering them using drones. Wow, that's very innovative of her. Yes, Apparently, yeah. she'd been using drones to get groceries delivered, and it, it doesn't say it, but I assume she just reached up into the air, grabbed one, and reprogrammed it on the spot. <laughs> it's a good idea, except for the part where you use the, the guided missile system to deliver the books. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, and that book delivery to Heathrow Airport didn't go as well as expected. <laughs> That's that's one of those stories where every now and then uh, everything is so crazy now. Sometimes it's just a pleasure to remember. Remember that Christmas when Heathrow got shut down because of a drone and it turned out no one knew if there was a drone there or not. <laughs> might have been a, it might have been a bird that was just furiously flapping its wings. Well, I mean... <laughs> You would think that if you worked at an airport, you would be able to tell different kinds of aerial objects apart. Um, not if it's a spot on a screen, with on I, a sonar screen. Do they still do that? I Am I just it, thinking of Air, Airport 77? Yes. <laughs> I guess it could have been a Boeing 747 <laughs> that they catastrophically misidentified. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a blip on the radar. <laughs> <laughs> Either it's a bird, or it's a drone, or it's a Boeing, or it's 99 red balloons. We don't know. <laughs> well, there's a spot on my monitor. I'm not entirely sure. Yes. On the alternatively, um, Concord can deliver a lot more books than a drone. Yep. Although it's been decommissioned, hasn't it? Oh, so that's even better. They're all sitting around doing nothing. <laughs> exactly. And they could be full of books delivering it to horrified school children running for cover. <laughs> <laughs> like the opening in of Wild Tales. <laughs> <laughs> well, some things have changed for the better recently. Some things have changed for the worst. And what, only one thing causes news when we don't know if it's changed that much at all. Andrew, get ready. <gasps> Andrew, warm your voice up. Fa, 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 so, 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 la, 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 some other musical notes. <laughs> <laughs> there is a headline in the New York Times which reads simply, George R. R. Martin is typing. And a one, and a two, and a one, two, three, four. Do 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 do. It's a jazz version. I like the version. Do 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 do. You better be doing those hands while you do this. Kind of. Oh my god! I was doing the hands that I didn't even realize. That's the power of jazz. 
<laughs> I kind of want to join in with some scat as well. Skip. Breaking new ground here. <laughs> First it was dun, 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 dun. There we go. It, it came back at the end. Nice. Ah, yes. I, I figured we maybe got a bit too in the weeds with the jazz bit, so I didn't pull it back. <laughs> <laughs> a bit too in the weed with the jazz bit, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Martin has said that uh, this whole global apocalypse thing has been just what he needs to actually sit down and write a bit more often. So that's what it takes. See, every cloud has a silver lining. Indeed. Yes. Turns out that silver lining is just not having literally anything else to do. (laughs) Or anything else to distract him. (laughs) Go Martin is a magpie. <laughs> <laughs> Any shiny thing, even if it only glistens slightly, he's after it. Any shiny <laughs> bunch of things that HBO drop off at his door. <laughs> no, I mean, just when he's out walking, maybe he's <laughs> gone to a restaurant. I mean, can you imagine? He, he, he must be a nightmare trying to get him back in the house. Yes. <laughs> Look, George, what's that on the floor? It's just a reflection off your watch or something like that. <laughs> Bouncing <laughs> off. And he's chasing after it like a cat with a laser. <laughs> you know that Simpsons episode where they're watching the PBS Pledge Drive? Yeah. And there's that parody <laughs> of a prairie home companion. And after doing a loads of really slow, boring jokes, Garrison Keeler goes, Well, I can't keep up this pace all night. I think we have a real-life equivalent of that. Uh, He says that he's cancelled the holiday to New Zealand, but says, the last thing I need now is a long interruption that might cost me all the momentum I have built up. (laughs) By which he means some momentum. Just (laughs) any momentum. (laughs) I like how how a global pandemic is just his version of a (laughs) run-up. Yes. So, yeah, uh, can't stop the girl Martin, it turns out. Uh, Another great publishing institution that I feel may be scraping the bottom of the barrel uh, that we've covered quite a lot is the Donald Trump tell-all genre. Oh, (gasps) Always an expanding genre. Hmm. Because obviously recently we've had The Room Where It Happens, the controversial memoir by America's armoured war walrus, John Bolton. Having trouble finding as much enthusiasm for this one, to be honest. Uh, In July, we will get a book about Trump by his niece. What, did he fire his niece? (laughs) (laughs) Was she not good enough to be his niece? (laughs) <laughs> Was she just really disappointed with the last Christmas present? <laughs> uh, sorry, now I've got that chubby brown song I've got about Santa going off of my head again. Yes, the niece of Roy Chubby Trump is going to release a book <laughs> called Too Much and Never Enough, which is coincidentally exactly how I feel about Trump memoirs. <laughs> Uh, but one minor reason why someone who's normal might be excited by this is that she was a source for the New York Times as Pulitzer winning investigation into Donald Trump's tax avoidance during the 1990s no word sadly on whether she was a source for the New York Times groundbreaking investigation into whether George R. R. Martin is writing or not <laughs> It's another one of these, isn't it? It it does appear to be another one of these. Yes. <laughs> I wonder how long that, how wide that genre is now. How many publications? I'm googling that. Uh, yeah, no. it, it feels like it. By the end of this first term, it will rival Balzac's comedy human in terms of <laughs> scope. <laughs> well, according to Business Insider. There are 22 books that reveal the inner workings of the Trump administration, (laughs) 
22. <laughs> the inner workings of the president. <laughs> As oh. if we needed another reason to want him voted out. Not even, I... not even about the president, just about the administration. Yes. I mean, that's how we are currently, but later, I mean, don't, don't hold your breath for the later publication by his proctologist. True. <laughs> I mean, that would be a Trump memoir I wouldn't want to read. <laughs> that, that would be a very literal Trump memoir. The thing is, they've got some great names. Devil's Bargain, Fire and Fury, Media Madness, Trumpocracy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess... <laughs> well, when they're looking for the next James Bond title, they've got plenty of inspiration. Yeah. I mean, th- this one, I love this one. It's even worse than you think. <laughs> That's the title. <laughs> See, all of these also work as potential titles for a book by his proctologist. Yep. <laughs> Killing Fire and Fury. Oh, it, it doesn't get any better. Killing the Deep State. <laughs> 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 the Trump. The Trump White House. <laughs> oh god the capitalist comeback <laughs> just oh. <laughs> born trump oh uh there's the spicy one the briefing <laughs> uh liars leakers and liberals the russia hawks <laughs> unhinged uh that was the omarosa one under fire which is april ryan fear trump in the white house <laughs> That's Bob Woodward, isn't yeah. it? Oh, wow. Team of Vipers, um, Kushner <laughs> Incorporated, uh, or Kushner Inc., a warning <laughs> by Anonymous. Oh, that's one of those awful genres of I am one of the resistance inside the Trump White House, and I'm pretty sure I'm turning this thing around, guys, books, isn't it? Yeah, because the next one is definitely that, which is Sarah Huckabee Sanders in, in her <laughs> Autobiography, Speaking for Myself. Oh, dear. God. Oh, the, be- the best lie of a title, A Very Stable Genius. <laughs> <laughs> there was an uh, extraordinary parody of those anonymous White House insider columns by The Hard Times, uh, where they wrote a column titled, Op-ed, I am part of the resistance inside Morrissey's backing band. <laughs> <laughs> That's genius. So, uh, in terms of other massive crises that have happened since we last recorded, um, this whole Black Lives Matter thing, mm. because it it wasn't enough that we had our generation's 1918 flu pandemic and our generation's 1930s style collapse into global autocracy. (laughs) Uh, We've got to have our generation's 1968 civil rights movement at the same time. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and it all seems to be happening in America. Goodbye, America. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, America. Um, But yes, this has prompted a couple of pieces of news that will fall into that new subcategory of stories that make you go, really? Not before? Huh. <laughs> uh, so our first, RNBH. See, I'm trying, to f- I'm trying to fit that into that song, Things That Make You Go, Hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Things That Make You Go, Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, good. I that song. <laughs> We've got a jingle for it now. <laughs> uh, our first things that make you go, really? <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why I'm no longer talking to white people about race by Rennie Edo Lodge has just become the first best-selling book, the first number one in the UK's official book charts, written by a black British author. Wow. Ever. Really? Wow. I did warn you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... I, I mean, I, you know, in the sense that it's happened is good. Yeah. The fact that this is the first time is not very good. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. Uh, In 2016, the Bookseller magazine did an analysis which proved that you are more likely to make it into the bestseller charts if your name is David than if you were from any ethnic minority. Oh, wow. 
but Edo Lodge has finally broken that curse. The only other, I say she's the only black British author, which is true, the only other black author to have made it to number one in the UK book charts is our old friend Michelle Obama. Nice. Yeah, friend of the podcast, probably. <laughs> uh, and in her comment on Twitter, uh, she says, it feels absolutely wild to have broken this record. And then, I think quite admirably, lists all of the other black British authors who you think, really? They didn't get to number one. No, no. Benjamin Zephaniah? No. Andrea Levy? No. Mallory Blackman? No. Zadie really? Smith? No. Six, what? No. Never. Mm. No. Why? Jesus, British book buying public. It's almost enough to make you think Britain's a bit racist. Oh, because that only happens in America normally. Yes. Yeah, anyway, we've uh, celebrated by uh, punting a big statue of Dan Brown into the river that runs through Bristol. (laughs) Uh, And in other things that make you go, really? Uh, The kid... (laughs) (laughs) The Kate Greenaway Medal for uh, chil- illustrated children's books has awarded its first ever non-white author. And how so, long's that been going? Uh, it was established in 1956. Where, to be Jeez. fair, there there weren't many illustrated children's books published by minority <laughs> authors back in 1956. But I would think that the that the 60 or so years in between would have offered a chance for redress. What makes mm-hmm. them, what makes these awards chill, though? What makes them chill? Yeah, you said chill Ill- illustrated book uh, children's books. I'm curious what makes them chill. Or is that some 1950s slang term? <laughs> Don't mock my inability to talk, Rob. I'm not. Uh, I, was it, oh, what? Right, was that... Uh, <laughs> was, was that... Uh, that wasn't a serious thing, was it? I was genuinely just going to say children's books, and I thought, oh, oh I'm really... straight to I thought, books. I thought they were actually called the children. <laughs> you think that there is a specific award for illustrated children's books that are just for hep and groovy cats? <laughs> yes! <laughs> Has that jazz game of Thrones theme affected your mind so much? Possibly, I don't know. I honestly <laughs> thought they were called the chill illustrated children's books. <laughs> <laughs> Marvellous uh, He has called Tanner's called his book Tales from the Inner City A strange book for strange times He said anxieties about climate change Fed into it It depicts animals Living in ruined cityscapes It has mm. a bit of a vibe Of that, you know that Tales from the Loop thing The illustrator who that series is based on Yeah Yeah, yeah a bit like that, it looks good so yeah, two records smashed by minority authors for the first time ever, and also Britain is embarrassing. That's my big takeaway <laughs> from the Veniedo Lodge story. Britain could try a bit harder on this one. Is it Britain, or is it just England? Yeah, that's a fair point. I am looking at some of these illustrations now. They are very cool. Like just mm. the one where it's like a bunch of horses on an abandoned sort of freeway thing. Yes, that was the one I saw. Oh, no. Almost like that's the only one included in the Guardian article that we're using as a source for this story. <laughs> <laughs> and it is quite chill, too, so that paid off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the circle is complete. But, listeners, I know what you're thinking. Uh, we've had two really positive stories about people from non-white backgrounds making massive strides forward. Have we also got some stories about white people being a total dingus about this? Yes. Surely we have. At least on Twitter. It's on brand for us. I will uh, I yeah. will give it that. Never mind. Not. I mean, I think it's also on brand for white people. <laughs> <laughs> ne- never mind on Twitter. I see it at work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Leela Shapiro's piece on Vulture.com has 
I mean, in any other week, it would be the best headline, but George R. R. Martin is typing is hard to beat. <laughs> <laughs> but she has got an article with the nevertheless great headline, The National Book Critics Circle Has Imploded. Right. Uh, sadly, not literally. America's National Book Circle had intended to put out a statement supporting Black Lives Matter and saying the publishing industry has got a lot more to do in terms of promoting diverse voices. Mm -hmm. uh, Ismail Mohammed, a black writer and critic, helped draft the statement and said, we were hoping to change ourselves and then model something for the entire industry. Mm -hmm. It turns out they sort of have done something, which I suspect the rest of the book industry will be paying attention to, uh, just in the worst way possible. They have accidentally proved that it is entirely possible for a major literary organisation to have a very well-meaning statement that is agreed upon by a majority of its staff derailed by one white dickhead. Jeez, Louise. I'm really glad uh, I didn't make that joke earlier on that was going through my head. <laughs> well, you're among friends now, Rob. What was it? <laughs> I was just... Uh, it was uh, when you said they implored. I was going to make a joke about how they were all standing in a circle trying to do some summoning ritual. Instead, they got a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> yes, fair point. Um, well, I mean, close. It, it is a hole. Yeah, but it's a white hole, and also <laughs> there's the word "ass" in there. <laughs> Every time someone references white holes, I just have to ask, but what is it? <laughs> it's the colon of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Carlin Romano, who even sounds like an old-timey slave owner drinking mint juleps on the plantation, <laughs> uh, has <laughs> triggered a series of events which one anonymous board member describes as bizarre and bloody in an end of a Tarantino movie kind of a way. Really? Hey, hey, they're they're book nerds, not movie nerds. Stay in your lane. <laughs> <laughs> is, this, is this another clowns to the left, left jokers to the right scenario? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how it could be paralleled to the end of a Tarantino movie unless someone's been using the N-word constantly, which feeding this article, maybe. Or everybody's um, dead. Yeah, I think that's probably what they were going for. <laughs> uh, a lot of people have resigned. Uh, oh. Romano is an 8,000-year-old critic who once made headlines for writing a review in which he imagined raping the author, which, I don't know, sounds like a no. bad idea. Is that, I mean, yeah, that almost sounds like a bad thing. That's uh, I, Yeah, I wouldn't really call that a criticism. That's more like a threat. And yet, if you said that now, the woke lefties would be haranguing you on Twitter for the crime of having threatened to rape someone, just like free speech martyr Graham Linehan. Yeah, just some bunch of feminazis. Yeah. Uh, uh, See, I, I, I was I sad to hear that guy died. Yeah, I was going to um, say, I could never get away with saying something like that, Sarah. <laughs> um, well, I'm not sure I can anymore. I'm, I'm not sure when it's from. <laughs> ah, yeah. Uh, we, we were discussing this, uh, listeners. I, I think feminazis is kind of 90s Rush Limbaugh misogyny, uh, which isn't to say it doesn't get pulled out, mm. but I think it's definitely SJWs now. Yeah, yeah what, what's SJWs? I don't know the meaning of that. Or, or a Stacey. What is a Stacey? I don't what? know, Stacey. SJW is social justice warrior. What okay. a charmed online life you've led, Sarah. I'm, I'm... <laughs> I'm you know, Sarah... on Twitter and everything. Yeah. Sarah's internet life is a bit like Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> it's a bit of a theme tune packed week this week, hasn't it? <laughs> Uh, anyway, Mohammed closes the piece by saying, uh, and th this is even better than the image of a, 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 of a ta end of a Tarantino movie. After Romano has said that he only censored his fellow's statement because he believes in free speech, because that's what they all say, uh, Mohammed says, it became clear that Carlin cannot be made to leave the board. He is shameless. 
At this point, he is sitting on a throne of skulls. Wow. Why would you want to censor that free speech guy? Yeah. Billy, he has the best words. He should be doing all the speaking. Exactly. Hmm. Anyone who can make a dispute among book critics sound like a Scandinavian black metal album should just <laughs> be listened to on everything. <laughs> Uh, so we close in similar vein with a very serious story about Britain's imperial past, which it continues to wrestle with. And I'd like to think that no detail in this story will raise juvenile sniggering uh, in any respect. <laughs> yes. The Shadow Foreign Secretary, Lisa Nandy, has written to Conservative counterpart Dominic Raab asking him to take down murals at the Foreign Office which convey imperialist themes and use racial stereotyping. Uh, the murals by the artist Sigismund Goatsey. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't. <laughs> I, swear, I promised myself I'd be serious, but I couldn't. <laughs> Uh, have been criticised as far back as the 90s with the former Labour Foreign Secretary, the late Robin Cook, said he ve felt very uncomfortable around Goatsey. I mean... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't hold it in anymore. <laughs> uh, Nandy has made a formal request for Rab to pull the Goatsey. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I did try. I was very mature up until the last minute, though. <laughs> the thing that, uh, the, the I think that's actually a game in Devon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, saying the depiction of Britannia as a benevolent goddess being tended to by small black children representing <laughs> the continent of Africa uh, falls short of the standards we expect from the Foreign Office, from British government and indeed from Goatsey. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, racist Goatsey, we're ending the news on that. Wow. Goatsey sounds some sort of, like some sort of... Um... Not like street wise, but farm wise, like renegade artist. Yeah, I was thinking this. Like, runs I was through th farms and d puts depictions on the side of barns at night when nobody's around. <laughs> I was, I was thinking exactly the same thing. Is he somehow related to Banksy? Is Banksy nicking someone else's <laughs> method? It's <laughs> racist motifs on the side of barns. Oh, it's goatsy again. <laughs> My pesky goatsy. Just some uh, uh, countryside police officer just shaking his fist at the moon, going, Damn you, Goatsy! Ah, you Goatsy! That darn Goatsy again! <laughs> <laughs> and just, uh, just off uh, from some hillside, you're like, You'll never catch me, Mutton Shunter! <laughs> <laughs> Superb callback. <laughs> Does he then kind of. Speed down the hill in his wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> Last of the summer wine with compo, clegg, and goatsy. Yeah, he doesn't a wear a hoodie. A different era. Yeah, he doesn't I'll, wear a hoodie, he wears select knitwear. I'll have you know it's a three speed barrow. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the speeds is still. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, no, but yes, also get rid of all the bad racist paintings. Yes. Yes, that seems yeah. like a good idea to me as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah, indeed. So, who's ready for a quiz? <gasps> Yay! We love a quiz! Yeah. Okay. A couple of weeks ago, I gave you a odd book title, Blankety Blank. Mm. Yes. And you guys seem to enjoy it. So well, we're suckers for punishment like that. I ha I have brought back more odd book titles <laughs> in another blankety blank. I'm going to reprise my more my role as my childhood role as the Asian Terry Wogan. Um, <laughs> oh God! <laughs> no, I was never as handsome as him. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I do wish I could have done Eurovision though. Um, Points of view? Any love for points of view? Or would you I have lots of I have lots of points of view. 
<laughs> that would have just been a show about me complaining about stuff. Never mind everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so what's Rob complained about this week? My knee hurts. My back hurts. <laughs> I haven't had breakfast. Where's my coffee? Right, okay. Odd book title, blankety blank. So first up, nice easy one for you guys. Okay. Don't, okay. don't blank on my leg and tell me it's raining. Whiz! No, sorry, I, mean, I got far too excited then. Yeah, pro- probably, probably piss. Yeah. Is Andrew still there? I mean, it's tough <laughs> because there's just not anything that's objectively more funny than piss. Yeah, yeah. It, it's exactly right. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. The man who mistook his blank for a hat. And other clinical tales. I know the answer to this one. Uh, yeah, I actually know this one. Uh, yeah. Sam, you'd like to go? Um, wife. Yeah. I assume Andrew's jumping on the bandwagon there. I did. Look, <laughs> I, I was going to sit here and think of something funny, but wife? <laughs> um, what? <laughs> How? <laughs> it's, Elaborate. It's exactly right. It is the man who mistook his wife for a hat. There are a lot of questions in that title. (laughs) Okay. The I mean the weight alone (laughs) should tip you off. (laughs) And what what and what type of hat? A bowler hat? A top hat? Was it a cap of some sort? Nothing's gonna make it make any more sense. (laughs) Exactly. I don't think if we heard he mistook his wife for a Panama hat, you're not gonna go, ah right. Yeah. Oh maybe that makes more sense. Now I understand. What if he what if it was a fedora and he thought he was Indiana Jones (laughs) then? No, don't go there, Brian. So does that mean he was at a bar and he met a nice attractive young (laughs) woman and tipped his wife and said, (laughs) My lady? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Moving on. The blank blank of melancholy cove. Cheerful git. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, actually, first word is probably an emotion of some sort. Second word is definitely some kind of animal person thing type thing. Right. So the format that Graham's answer is in is correct. Lackadaisical swine. <laughs> ah. Is this a Jessica Fletcher book? Mm, I don't think it, so. It does sound like it. It sounds like a, a cosy mystery, which I'm yeah. a big fan of. <laughs> <laughs> the disgruntled Wendigo of Melancholy Cove. <laughs> I mean, it's probably wrong, but I would read it. Um, the... Also, I, I do appreciate, though, I can't remember who said it, but I, I would post it basically called out the fact that the Wendigo is basically just an indie werewolf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um... In, in movies, I mean, not like traditional mythology. In traditional mythology, it's scary as hell, isn't it? It's one of the creepiest legends there is. Ooh. It's like a, an Arthurian legend as well. The Wendigo of Arthurian legend. It's, no, I think it originates from uh, Canada, doesn't it? It's Native American, oh, yeah. yeah. Join us um, again next week for Wendigo <laughs> discussion. <laughs> so anyway, Sarah, what was your guess? Sorry, the something something of what? Melancholy Cove? Yeah. Oh, God. It, sounds, it just reminded me of Cape Fear. Like, why would you go on holiday there in the first place? <laughs> Um, oh, the uncommon uh, weasels. <laughs> well, everyone's uh, everyone's kind of off the mark. A l- Fancy. Yeah, uh, the lust lizard. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> well, now. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I don't know what the lost lizard is, but <laughs> again, a title. Damn it, I, I know I should have stuck to my original brain guns and said horny wendigo. <laughs> <laughs> is that Trixie goaty again? <laughs> goaty again. Right. The particular sadness of blank blank. Michael Gove. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
The Particular Sadness of... Are all of these titles a bit morose? No. (laughs) (laughs) They do sound a bit like Victorian, don't they? Yes. The Particular Sadness of the Average Post Office Clerk. (laughs) The Particular Sadness of Turning on the One Show and realising it's one of the episodes which Chris Evans guest hosts. I don't know how you've managed to fit that into blank blank, but... (laughs) (laughs) Do you want the answer? Please. Lemon cake. Lemon cake. I mean, it's cake, so I don't see what's particularly sad about it. Yeah, lemon <laughs> cake is one of the best ones. It's mm. literally zesty. <laughs> exactly. It is. It's okay. sweet, nicely cut through by the sharp. I yeah. thought, I, I'm watching the new series of Talking Heads at the moment, and I cannot hear that title <laughs> in anything other than Alan Bennett's voice. Yeah. Well, if you hear this next title in Alan Bennett's voice, then, you know, I'll buy you a packet of Starburst. Okay. E- everyone, <laughs> what? Poops. I mean... Oh, God, it's probably it's just everyone poops, isn't it? Survey's probably right, but I want to stick with my uh, Alan Bennett theme and say everyone likes a bit of Battenberg and a cup of tea on the evening. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. it's, it's not funny if I disagree with so. Everyone consumes the flesh of a human being whilst in on holiday in Canada, thus damning themselves to eternal torment as a Wendigo. Is, is this some bizarre competition? How many words can you fit into one blank? <laughs> yes. It's very small writing. <laughs> yes, Sarah is correct. Everyone poops. Yay. Okay. Um, God's Doodle, The Life and Times of What? How many blanks before we get accused of over-blanking? The, uh, it's, uh, it, technically, it's two blanks, but it's referring to uh, something singular. God's doodle... Wi- the life and that's and, it? The life and times of what? The life and times of blank blank. Yeah. But the blank blank is technically just one thing. Okay. Um... Bogner Regis. <laughs> <laughs> God's Doodle, The Life and Times of the Nazca Lines. I realise this sounds like one of the comedy rude answers I do, but I genuinely (laughs) am convinced it might be the penis. And Graham gets a point. (laughs) Yes! (laughs) Oh, wow! Well done. Okay. Uh, Life is a circus run by a what? Uh Oh, I'm on to you now, Rob. Penis. (laughs) (laughs) Penis. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't say things like that again, Andrew. <laughs> I'm on to you now, and then say, <laughs> "It's not Life good." Is Life is a circus run by the lust lizard of melancholy. <laughs> <laughs> Does he have a tiny lizard top hat on? Oh yay! <laughs> <laughs> also, please note, I didn't say where he's wearing the top hat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, life is a circus run by. Do you guys want a clue? I think we might need one, yeah. Okay, it is an animal and not a very common one. Coelacanth, it is. <laughs> <laughs> life is a circus run by a coelacanth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they had to be doing something during all those millions of years. <laughs> Life is a circus run by a dodo. Life is a circus run by the lions. Andrew? Ardvark. <laughs> Buffalo? Do you know? And Cheetah? Are you Literally, just going through the alphabet in your to... encyclopedia of animals, Andrew? Yes. <laughs> no. Do you, okay. Dog. The answer is platypus. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Life is a circus run by a platypus. I'm not sure what the message is there. The minotaur takes a what? Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> <take> it. <laughs> I mean... it's, it's two blanks. 
So the Minotaur takes a, big... a blank blank. <laughs> Go see some more contentious <laughs> mute roles there. Oh, the Minotaur takes a big. <laughs> Is it just the Minotaur takes a city break? You know, finally decided he's going to get out of that labyrinth. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's time for a bit of me time, you know. That would be great. Roll the with a minus <laughs> I, I think I know this one, uh, by which I mean I have seen this in a bookshop and thought, huh? Oh. <laughs> uh, it's the minus or takes a cigarette break. Yes, ah. it is. Uh, I was going to oh, say, well, big... that's actually not far off, man. <laughs> it isn't. Ah. So I will give Andrew half a point for his as well. Okay, uh, the aerodynamics of what? <sighs> Paper planes? One blank. Maybe. Oh, okay. Um, what do you say there, Rob? It's one blank. One blank. blank. Yeah. One blank, right, right, okay. Hippopotami. Uh, what is a funny word? <laughs> I don't know why. But for some reason, the word that popped into my head is gender. What? Oh, yeah, I, I don't know. The aerodynamics of gender? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> got to admit, he's got a title that might outweigh the one that yeah. is actually real. I'm impressed. The aerodynamics of bricks. <laughs> Insurrectionary reading for our troubled times. Yes. Up the people. <laughs> um, hold on to that thought, because that's a good segue for the next one. Uh, but, yeah, it's the aerodynamics of pork, but I will give Andrew a point for the aerodynamics of gender, because that one just was more bizarre. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wrong, but better, I think. Yep. Uh, we should start giving points for... Yeah. Um, yeah, genuinely, I feel like I need to Google this now just to make sure this is like just a phrase I've seen somewhere. Because <laughs> to be honest, if it's just something that my brain meat made up on its own, I'm quite scared. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, speaking of uh, up the people, up a tree in the park at night with a what? Hot water bottle. Oh, of course. Aerodynamics of gender is an episode of Community. Ah. Uh. Uh. I love that show. That's the best show. It and is, also... and thankfully gives me a rational explanation for why <laughs> I said just a very weird <laughs> phrase. <laughs> and features the global phenomenon that is Donald Glover. Indeed. Mm. So up, um, a week, up a tree in the park at night oh. with a blank. Donald Glover? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it's a it's a good kin, isn't it, to that lyric from Talk Show Host by Radiohead. You want me, you can fucking come and find me. I'll be waiting with a gun and a pack of sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just it reminded me of um of what is it afternoon in the park with George? Sunday in the park with George. Sunday in the park with show. George. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to say George. Andrew? I mean, I'm tempted to just stick with my original answer of Donald Glover. <laughs> oh, right. You said Donald Glover, <laughs> didn't you? Uh, okay. All right. Up a tree at night, up a tree in the park at night with a hedgehog. Okay. I okay. don't want to know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> right. Blank, blank for the soul. Stories to harden the heart and dampen the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so not chicken soup. Uh, chicken soup. Neat whiskey. Medicinal bleach. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that back here was coronavirus. What are you on about? What's the rest of it again? Blank, blank for the soul. Stories to harden the heart and dampen the spirit. And pints of seawater. Thank God that ended with water. <laughs> <laughs> flashbacks to an old urban myth about Mark Armand. No, no, no. no. Oh, actually, I God, suppose we could have brought everything full circle. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Do you know, I'm going to give Graham half a point because his very first answer 
was only a few letters away from being correct. It's not oh. it's not chicken soup for the soul. It's chicken poop for the soul. Uh, <laughs> oh, I get it. It's a play on the turn. Okay. Yes. Blank for accountants. Privacy. <laughs> vigorous lovemaking. <laughs> Sword fights. I, mean, I, I do like that we've both kind of gone down the route of the crew of the Crimson Permanent Assurance. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Going to give Sarah the uh, point for being the closest. It's actually sadomasochism for accountants. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why is that just like deliberately moving the dot a couple of places to the left? <laughs> <laughs> right, this next one. I read the, I had to read the reread this a couple of times before I was convinced that I was actually reading a real book title. Teach okay. your wife to be a blank. Hat. <laughs> <laughs> Good callback. <laughs> Teach your wife to be a Blank. Yeah. Okay. Snappy. This one has a very sharp turn. Teach your wife to be a knife. <laughs> <laughs> not not a literal sharp. <laughs> Teach your wife. I kind of want to say lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, teach your wife to be an ex-wife. Yes. <laughs> yeah, or a feminist or something. <laughs> Saxophonist. <laughs> you know, well, you know those first thoughts you had about teach yes. your wife to be an ex-wife. They're closer than you think. Teach your wife to be a widow. What? Yeah. <laughs> I am reminded of that old uh, photo of Donald Trump and Melania Trump going to visit the Pope, where she was all dressed in black. And someone said, ah, yes, you should always dress for the job you want. In this case, <laughs> Nice. Right. How to survive a blank, blank attack. And I will give you the tagline for this, but it may make okay. it easier. Defend yourself when the lawn warriors strike, and they will. The lawn warriors? Rabbit yes. gnome? <laughs> I mean, finally, a book teaching me how to defend myself against a hungry Wendigo. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I don't know. A grieved field mouse. <laughs> Ooh, that's a bit of a red wall callback, isn't it? <laughs> it is very red wall, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Aggressive newt. <laughs> See, now I'm thinking Newt Gingrich. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the ladies of Washington could probably do with a book like that. <laughs> How to defend yourself against a handsy Republican. <laughs> <laughs> How to survive a blank, blank attack. A big heart attack. <laughs> ah, yes, the, the alternate ending to The Grinch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, Graham's original answer of rabbit gnomes was basically the closest. It's garden gnome attack. Wow. <laughs> wow. Defend yourself when the lawn warriors strike, and they will. <laughs> right, and this one, I think this one, it, this is the final one, and I think this one, well, if, you buy the, if you're buying this book, then <sighs> I worry... I really worry. <laughs> Liberace, your personal blank blank. Style guide. Your personal wingman. Because <laughs> <laughs> if there's one character who knows how to score with the ladies, <laughs> Liberace. Ladies love cool Liberace. <laughs> yeah. See, that one just sounds like, uh, like, you know, an advert for some kind of male smellies. <laughs> cool Liberace for men. Yeah. It's actually a little known fact that Liberace's first name was Chad. <laughs> Chad Liberace. <laughs> and he received an award for chill pianist. <laughs> Liberace. 
I'm going to stick with style guru, I think. Liberace, your personal. Or plastic surgeon, maybe. <laughs> well, he was good with his hands. There is that. Mm. Unless we're going down the wrong route and it's Liberace, your personal pocket guide. <laughs> But you know when you're out on the street and you suddenly need <laughs> one of your hot Liberace bags to, again to impress the ladies. When you, when you quickly need to identify a species of Liberace seen in the wild. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, Liberace, your personal defence mechanism. <laughs> Krav Maga by Liberace. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, Graham is really good at these uh, odd book titles because <laughs> it's not it's not style guru, but it is fashion consultant. Excellent. <laughs> and if you are buying this book, I worry, <laughs> really worry. <laughs> oh, so yeah, I think Graham wins that one. Fabulous. Well I'd like to thank the Academy. Yeah, fabulous is a good description of that last book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> although some of the other answers were great as well. I like the uh, pocket guide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, mean, I kind of want like a Liberace pocket guide now. <laughs> yeah, a Liberace pocket, a po- Liberace, a personal pocket guide <laughs> with identification and checklist. <laughs> yes, <finally. laughs> Liberace. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just spend a weekend in the woods, Liberace watching. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. Okay, so yeah, indeed. Another did quiz. We ever, did we ever find out what John Lennon's cat was called? Um, I'm gonna have to. Hang on. Yes, well, uh, I did have that. The... I did have that up. Hang on, two seconds. Is it Diamudens? <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, I found it. Uh, uh, he had a cat called Jesus. Ah. Oh, that. Oh, so the did. Beatles genuinely were bigger than Jesus because cats are yeah. only about a foot tall. Yeah, exactly. I know, I'm glad we had that. I think sometimes with John Lennon, it's easy to think about him only in terms of his music. Yeah, and forget just what a massive planet he was. <laughs> <laughs> now John Lennon's cat was called Elvis. Ah, uh, yeah. Charles de Gaulle had a cat called Gris Gris. The Kennedys mm-hmm. had Tom Kitten. Samuel Johnson had Hodge. George W. Bush had uh, Spotty and Barney. Lord Byron had Boatswain. Awesome. We, well, we know, but yeah. what was this cat called? Uh, Isaac Newton. <laughs> uh, is that how you pronounce it? Is it Boston? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've always pronounced it Botswain and thought It's Boston an old was... sailing term. <laughs> <laughs> New- Isaac Newton had diamond. These are all like cats and dogs, by the way, not just right. cats. Uh, Hog- pets. Yeah, Hogarth had Trump. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. It see, was all at all. See, this is the thing that <laughs> where where Shots Missile Any gets a little bit weird because it says famous cat and dog owners. Apparently, Sputnik 2 was the owner of Laika. And I don't think that's the case. I suppose Laika did get owned by Sputnik too. <laughs> I don't think Laika had much to do with that. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 this shots with has some uh, has some interesting bits. I mean, he's got like the line of kings all the way through, but then he's got the monarch n- mnemonic, which is uh, let me see if I can read this. Willy, Willy, Harry, Harry, Sue, so, stay. Is that stay or Sue? Stay, stay, Harry, Dick, John, Harry, three, one, two, three, Ned's, Richard, two, Harry's, Harry's, four, five, six, then who, Edward, six, five, Dick the Bad, (laughs) rude, (laughs) yeah, Harry's twin, and Ned the Lad, Uh, Mary, Bessie, James the Vane, Charlie, Charlie, James again, again, William and Mary, Anne, Gloria, sorry, William and Mary, Anne, Gloria, four Georges, William and Victoria, Edward, seven, next and then George, five in 1910, Edward, eight, soon abdicated, George the, George the six was coronated, after which Elizabeth, and that's the end until her death. A cheerful ending then. Yep. 
So it's not all gold. Yeah, and, uh, that, <laughs> and then right after that is uh, prefixes in numbers. Then it's the 12 labors of Hercules. Then reindeer. <laughs> then British Poets Laureate. The Ten Commandments. TV Standards. US Presidential Inauguration. Cricket fielding positions, which still make no sense to me. I don't know what a, <laughs> I don't know what a deep mid wicket or a or a deep square leg or a square leg or a mid off or you know a, a silly point is or a silly mid off. This is how random it is. So when you say, "Okay, what's on this page?" I'm like, "Ah, uh, I've got to remember." <laughs> there is well, no. We, we there sort is of no... expected you to turn to the page more than remember it off by heart. Mm. But, okay, but yeah, if you don't remember it off by heart, how are you supposed to use it at a, at a dinner party or something like that? Fair point. Fair point. I mean, it's even got like uh, you know compound plurals. In the right next to How to Wrap a Sari. Hmm. <laughs> and some versions of Arthurian legend. The knights have to go on the grail quest after Arthur got stabbed in the nard so hard that all the trees died. <laughs> <laughs> that might actually be in here somewhere. You can't beat that, Rob. There's no use trying. Do the aggro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on that note... Um... <laughs> On the note of Arthur's nards. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a C minor. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, if you want to catch any of our previous episodes, you'll find them all on our website, thegeekshow.co.uk, or you'll find them all on whatever podcast service you're using. Uh, we are available on basically all of them. And if you're listening through anything like that, then leave us a rating, leave us a review. It does help us with exposure, and it does help us improve. If you're heading to our website, then uh, there, it is undergoing some changes at the moment, but on the current site, you'll also find all of our other shows and uh, also reviews of various other things, like movies and stuff like that. Um, we also have a YouTube channel, which you'll find by going ahead to, head to YouTube and just Google, uh, just type in The Geek Show and you'll find us. Pretty easy. Anyway, uh, that's it from us. We'll see you all again in a couple of weeks' time. But until then, I've been Rob. I've been Sarah. I've been Graham. And I've been Andrew. We'll see you all next time. I've done that already, haven't I? I've forgotten how I end the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I was too focused on Arthur's nods. <laughs> I mean, as were we all. <laughs> <laughs>